Thank you. Excuse me, everybody. Excuse me. We're about to start. I'm going to do this one here to Leah Hendricks. Oh, hi. And we're being like web, web live streamed. <laughs> um, so I guess we should use the microphone. Um, so I've always been you know, interested in the economy as kind of the issue that underlies a lot of the other issues that we're trying to get at through philanthropy. And um, after Occupy, I think it became clear for a lot of people that economic inequality is one of the biggest challenges of our time. And it seemed like there was almost a cultural shift after, in, after 2011 and 2012 to the question of what are the solutions then? Like what, it, what, how do we find structural solutions to this problem of economic inequality? And so the conversation about the new economy just started popping up everywhere and organizations started changing their names to the new economy. You know, there's the new economy network that Sarah Stranahan was involved with and then the new economy institute and in super new economic thinking and the new economy project and, and everybody has their new economy thing. And, um, and so, and I had gotten involved through Brendan Martin uh, in the working world. We had jumped into this factory buyout in Chicago where workers were taking over their window factory and created a new era window uh, cooperative and, um, and had joined the board of the New Economy Coalition. And, but was, I was really interested in what philanthropy was going to have to say on this topic. And so Sarah Stranahan and I came to Philanthropy New York and said, where, who's having this conversation and what are, what other foundations are involved with this? And they said, well, we think there are some, but we don't, nothing has really been organized around it yet, so why don't you go ahead and create that, you know, create some space for that conversation. So in September, we had a, um, a meeting with a handful of foundations that were already using this language and committed to this uh, field. And we decided to, we recognized that there was a lot of difference in the room and a lot of uh, lack of clarity and kind of, you know, so we still don't know what we're talking about, but um, but we're but we thought that that's okay. That's really a good thing. That there's something here that a lot of us are grasping at from different angles. And so, why don't we go ahead and create some ongoing space to continue the conversation? And we decided to set up a series. This is a six-part series with one session every other month, and where each session gets at the question of the new economy through a different lens. So we're doing um, economic democracy or kind of the Corporate, corporate side of things, work, um, finance, money, money and politics and democracy, food and climate. And with the thesis that a lot of these, the, all these things are tied together at a deep structural level um, and that the idea of the new economy gets at them. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone so much for, for uh, helping to co-organize this. This has been a super collaborative effort. And so I want to really thank Eddie and Jose for organizing this session um, and Philanthropy New York for hosting and for, to all of our speakers. And also note that um, you all have uh, lots of papers in front of you. The EDGE Funder Alliance was also a really important co-convener uh, co for this. Um, and they're having a conference in May that will get at these issues in more depth. And um, the Sustainability Funders group has a new economy discussion group. So if you also want more email interaction about this question, you can join their, you can sign up for their listserv outside. Um, but I'll go ahead and hand it over to Eddie to kick us off. So we really feel privileged to be able to, to be an active participant in the, the first of this series. You know, at the Rockefeller Foundation, one of our central goals is to advance inclusive economies toward more broadly shared prosperity. And we're lucky enough to be joined by our managing director, John Irons, who leads this work uh, here in the States. 
And uh, toward this end, we um, support for a range of activities from scholarship to on the ground innovations. We support such thought leaders as Shiv Kumar and Jared Bernstein and our friends at Center for American Progress and uh, Policy Link on their, on their writing and their efforts to inform public policy. And we also support on the ground innovations uh, towards new jobs for young people in Africa and here in the States, and also on the ground innovations here in our uh, hometown of New York, efforts like the Participatory Budgeting Project and Solidarity NYC, and we're privileged to be able to be joined by some of our grantees at this event today. And we feel really privileged to be in such fine company throughout this process, and we're really very excited about what this process yields. I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Jose at the Cerna Foundation. Then we're going to show a brief film that actually introduces the, the arc of how this idea developed. Hello, everybody. Stream. Hello. I'm not going to hear. It's OK. Thank you. So I'm Jose Garcia from the Cerna Foundation. I'm currently at the Strong Local, Strong Local Economies. I'm a program officer there. And we're at Accent. You know, as Edwin, we're very excited. It's been an incredible collaborative process. It was great to be working with Edwin. Working, working with Leah and Mark as they had the series. And it provided actually a great space for CERN to explore some of these issues that actually are part of our, our theory of change and how we think about uh, this, this work. For us particularly, the intersection around the economy, sustainability, and culture are actually part of our three programs. So we, we clearly believe uh, to build actually sustainable community. We clearly believe that the work lives between those spaces. And, when, and we have to be intentionally our, our social justice right? uh, frame that have to be kind of like the, 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 the underlying work around that. And for the strong local economies particularly, we're work, working, we want to increase the prosperity of this nation. At the same time, we're actually creating quality jobs and we create mobility as we're doing this work. right? And, and as we do that, we know that our low wage sectors are what is the areas that will be increasingly part of, of our, uh, increasing part of the economy. So, and we have actually a part of our program that deal with quality job, minimum wage, pay sick day. But we think there is a business, a design question, uh, an issue that, that how do you deal with these businesses, right? Uh, that could be part of it. And that's what we're exploring at Double Triple Bottom Line type of businesses. That's what we think that, that to alimentate this vision in which businesses are line to line with human and the environment is a critical part of the equation. That, it, that we want to create a vision where there is not an oxymoron to talk to the economy and to talk about people and to talk about the environment and businesses, right? Uh, and that's what we're exploring issues, not issues, a uh, different type of, of alternative business structure that is a B Corp, that is the co-op, uh, co uh, worker co-ops, um, and ESAPs and others. That, and how do you create that infrastructure? Uh, and that's why we actually were involved and very interested not only in this area, but how all this work together to create a new vision of how the economy uh, works. And um, with that said, I think we now do have to present the movie, which is actually a movie that was done actually for this series by the Edge Funders Alliance. Um, they actually, I think, is a great encapsulation of what the series is about. But well, with further ado, I will leave you with the film. And I just want to let our live stream viewers know that you can click on the link above to access the video we're about to show. There's a lot of talk about the economy these days. Some people say the economy is taking up. Some people say it's tanking. If you really want to make sense of the economy, it's useful to take a big step back and ask yourself, what does economy mean? But the heart is this tiny little word, eco. And eco means all. Ecosystem is all of the complex relationships of all. Ecology is the knowledge or study of all. And then you get economy. Economy is simply the management of all. So there are three basic pillars that are true for all economies. You need resources. You need land, air, water. You need the living world around you. The second pillar is you need work. You need labor to combine with those resources to produce stuff. And then you need a culture, a cosmology, a worldview that tells us what we can do with our labor towards what ends with the world around us. Then what are the pillars of the dominant economy, the economy that's all around us right now? 
Well, we get our resources through extraction. We forcefully remove them from the earth. We get our labor through exploitation. Resources and labor have to be acquired at the lowest possible price. And the culture is one in which we can have endless and infinite growth that denies the real ecological and social consequences towards one very particular end. The accumulation of greater and greater monetary wealth and power. The big corporations are being governed really for the benefit of the CEO. It's not even for the shareholders anymore. The same way that the basis of minor production is extraction from the planet, minor finance is extraction from a larger community towards the financial community towards one percent. This is not only an economic issue about who's getting the money, it's also a racial issue, it's also a class issue. This economy often leaves out people of color, immigrants, minority communities, women. So the question is, if the extractive economy is what got us into the mess we're in right now, can it get us out? Not likely. What is required is fundamentally to transform, to transform the way things are structured. The depth to which corporations are integrated into economies around the world, meaning we absolutely have to think at the global level, the international level. We need to explore new ways to manage the The new economy has to step away and then push back the those old colors because it has to be a new economy that puts people for profit, that puts planet. The first pillar is to rethink our relationship to resources. There's simply no way that we can have this endless, limitless, infinite growth on what is like the, obviously the finite planet. The second pillar has to replace the exploitation of human labor with a recognition that when we take our labor and apply it towards economic well being, we can create a new cycle that's based on regeneration. That requires a new a new way of imagining our relationship to each other and to home. It's not only possible, it's happening all around us. One of the most inspiring things is that there are people, groups, all over the country and the world who are organizing both to meet people's needs and to actually confront the systems that are underneath the crisis. Underlying all of it is a small group democracy. I think it could actually change the way things are going to have people actually participate and the decisions that are governing their lives. Any economic transition has to have this notion of restructuring the way we think about ownership that demands some political muscle, some organizing muscle, and some idea muscle. How do we develop new business models that create more local ownership and more democratic ownership? Even philanthropy is moving to change. The greatest task for our is is not simply to give to what exists, but to reimagine what is possible. The most basic thing we talked about is human factors. The rising sense of self awareness, the sense of how we behave, how we think, how we understand the world we're in, and how we form relationships. And the extent that we start transforming this understanding of those relationships, that's part of forming the new economy today, here and now. By looking at how we live, we can find how we can make better, more and simultaneously invest in and build the economy we know we need. And maybe we can be happier for it. So, uh, what a great film, right? It's like. <laughs> I'm actually get excited about this general idea of what is actually possible, right? And and reimagining the possibility of with our creativity. So around any type of question that we have around the uh, you know strategy, we can do it on the Q and A from Edwin or, or, or I. Uh, but now we'll I will go to actually for for the fun here. And I'm so excited uh, to have such an incredible moderator and of course a panel. But you know she's a Books, you know, a best-selling author, a broadcaster. She is a strong local economies fellow at Jazz Magazine. Uh, she's contributed to the nation. Uh, she hosts a lot of Flounder Show at Grid TV. Uh, she writes, you know, for being MSNBC. I mean, what can I say? She, she is, she is the moderator to have in a panel like this. And, and thank you so much for having you here with us. Thank you, Jose.
Great to be here. And great to be here with all of you. I'll just step up for a second. I don't quite know what the cameras are catching or, or not of, of our live stream, but I want to also welcome our live streaming audience at home. Um, and all of you to an extraordinary panel. It was an amazing film. Thank you to the people that made it. Um, for a little background on me, I six years ago founded an independent media organization called Brits TV. Uh, and inspired partly by Aaron Dunn and Roy's line that another world is not only possible, it's already here. Listen and hear her breathing. And Great TV was really founded with the notion of listening carefully to that breathing and giving meaningful attention, um, giving meaningful attention to the people we call the world's most important marginalized experts. In our collaboration with Yes Magazine, courtesy of Park to the Serna Foundation, um, we've launched a new reporting initiative called Commonomics, which is taking me all across the country and my team as much as possible across the country to report on initiatives that are building, right here and now, strong local economies. Um, we started by talking to people here at home, and then writing about here at home in New York City about what's possible, and talking with, among others, Yurman about the extraordinary uh, initiative around the Bronx Armory that, that he and his colleagues have been part of. I then have been very heavily involved in covering the story of the New Era Windows Factory in Chicago. I was just in Chicago looking at this extraordinary worker-owned cooperative that's hoping to keep jobs in an under, underprivileged part of uh, southwest Chicago. And then inspiringly and also sadly, I just literally came back from Jackson, Mississippi, where I got, I think, one of the last interviews with Jackson's incredible mayor, Shokwe Lumumba if you want to know more about somebody who is really putting into place a new economy um, and putting it into place with social justice first and foremost on his mind. Uh, we've transcribed the whole interview and it's available at Yes Magazine and there's more to come on that. So I couldn't be more excited to be here with this panel as we talk about what might an inclusive economy look like. We certainly don't live in one, so what might one look like? Uh, what will it take to build such a thing? Who do we think is going to do that building? And how can we, the rest of us, and especially people with some resources, uh, do to help? And we have, as you can see, a, a panel of, of experts who could each talk on this for um, an hour themselves. But I've asked them to be generous and cooperative. And instead, we're going to frame this as a conversation. And then we're going, we're going to talk for probably an hour, hour and a quarter, and then come to all of you for, for questions and have continue the conversation as a group. Um, Kelly Terry Sepulveda has been an extraordinary leader up at the point, about which she'll tell you more, community organization in Hunts Point. Andrew Kasoy is with B Lab, which is the nonprofit behind B Corps. Uh, Melissa Hoover is with the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives and really has a kind of national perspective on what's going on. And Yorman Nunez is, uh, well, I met him as I was doing the story about the Bronx um, Armory and found out about the Bronx Cooperative Initiative, that he's a development initiative that he's a part of. Uh, it comes directly from his experience in community organizing into an organization dedicated to how do we actually build economic power in a community. So let's start. Why don't we start with you, Yorman? Talk a little bit about uh, what your work is today and how you see it relate to this question of building inclusive economies. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Laura. Um, so BCDI, right, the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, uh, is an effort that really started from frustrations community organizations have had with how economic development processes are realized in their communities and how you don't get the benefits, the, the returns uh, that we believe we deserve. Um, and, and I, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of tension-filled economic development fights that, that go on in, in the Bronx. Between Kelly and, and I, we could probably talk about just that for, for, for an hour. But, you know, at some point, the way economic development is done in our communities, we you know, a, a few of us came together and realized that, that we're just always, it's set up for, o, for us to always be in an adversarial position, right? Someone else outside of our community has some big idea that's going to make 
a million bucks, comes in and tries to convince an elected official and a few other people to, to implement it. And then we have to vet the idea on our own. And it's always that we don't, we don't see the benefits that we deserve, and then we fight the project. Um, so really, we came around the, we came around to try to figure out what can we build, what, what is the infrastructure we can build in our communities where we could be more proactive. We're, we're not automatically in an adversarial position to, to development, but in a more proactive position. And, and to build an economy that's not extractive, that's not exploitive, but an economy that's generative, that's resilient, um, that, that reflects our values. Um, so, you know, that's in a nutshell um, what we're about. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to get more specific with, Laura, but right now what we're really looking at um, is this idea of import substitution uh, and, and cross-sector network building. So, so we've really learned and we're inspired by uh, in an experiment that happened in, in Mondragon, in, in Spain, in the Basque region called the, you know, the Mondragon Corporation, which we all definitely should know about. And if you, you haven't, please just go, go research. Um, and and that, what that experiment demonstrated to us is the incredible, incredible power of a network and what happens when you have a multi-sector sort of stakeholder table coming together, uh, coordinating, and, and democratically uh, developing a local economy. The next thing that really inspired us was this idea of import substitution. And it really inspired us in the Bronx because the Bronx, although it's the poorest urban economy, poorest urban county in the United States of America, we have incredible, powerful economic infrastructure. We have the third largest business district in New York City, right? Uh, Fordham Road. Fordham Road it's, itself also sees as much foot traffic as Herald Square, right? We have, and that's not our only successful commercial corridor. We, I can name four others easily off the top of my head: the Hub, Westchester Square, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's not that we're incapable of generating wealth. It's that it's all flowing out elsewhere. And we need to develop mechanisms to capture it, and not just capture it and replicate what we've seen all along, but capture it in a way where uh, it's distributed equitably at its creation point. And I think that's why we're really um, inspired by and the, our principal model that we support is the worker-owned cooperative. Because um, it doesn't just do that, but it also reflects our values on around governance and how we should have shared governance as well. But you know, that's what we're focusing on. I think that's what folks in local poor communities of color should <laughs> should be focusing on. And I look forward to you know any other questions. Let's go to you, Andrew. You're taking on the business sector part of this. What does B Lab and the B Corp do? Um, does anybody care? How many people have heard of a B Corp? So I can kind of like okay. Uh, so w I, I'm one of the co-founders of a nonprofit called B Lab. Um, we started about six and a half years ago, and the focus of what we were doing was basically the idea that um, we looked around and said, 80 percent, 75 or 80 percent of GDP in most economies comes from the private sector. So wherever you are in your view of capitalism or the role of business in society, one way or the other, if we want, uh, if we want to address some of the big problems that we face, businesses going to have to play a role. Uh, and the question is how, how we uh, facilitate that happening uh, in a more systemic way. Because right now, sorry, can you read that? Right now, that's quite rare. No, it's, it's all. Uh, right now, it's pretty rare. Um, and it's rare for a bunch of systemic reasons. One of them that was pointed out, I think, in the, um, in the, in the movie was um, is a cultural reason. Like, we're all pretty focused on consuming more, cheaper, uh, and therefore getting all the inputs that go into that consumption as cheaply as possible, including labor. Um, and uh, But there are some others as well, like marketing. Even if you wanted to support companies that were actually doing something useful or were actually creating a positive impact, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between a good company and good marketing. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, lots of big companies are plenty aware that people actually would like to work for a company that has some values that's trying to create create a positive impact on the world. And they're plenty aware that, uh, uh, that consumers would rather buy from companies uh, that they can trust or that reflect their values. That's why so many companies, I mean, you can't open up a magazine uh, without seeing just about every ad at this point has, you know, wind, windmills, sun 
flowers, solar panels, somebody holding some fertile earth, usually, <laughs> usually, you, usually the person is in Africa or Latin America, and the commercial, the commercial is the ad is for, it doesn't matter what it's for, right? So they're plenty aware. Marketing is a big thing. Um, and, then the, and then the third thing that we, we saw that was a huge impediment to business behaving in a different way is, is law. Uh, the law of the land, particularly in the U.S. Um, corporate law says that the duty of the directors and officers of a corporation are to maximize value for the shareholders, period. Uh, and as long as that's true, that also means that their, their duty is to, uh, is to externalize onto society as many costs as they possibly can in order to maximize those profits. So that's a big problem too. So we basically looked at all those things and said, we need a better way to do business. Um, and, and that's going to require changing the rules of the game. Um, and, and the problem, though, is that where the power is in business is not with people who would like to change the rules of the game. In fact. If they want to change the rules of the game, they just want to make it easier to do it the way they've been doing. Uh, and so we said, really, we need to build a movement uh, of businesses that want to do business in a different way, who can lead, and a movement of all of their stakeholders who can support um, <clears throat> uh, if we want to see anything really change. And so that was the kernel of an idea which was called the B Corporation. And, and what we said was the B stands for benefit, or if you're a little bit more uh, spiritual, be the change we seek in the world. Um, and, and the idea was, let's create a certification that allows us to tell the difference between a good company and good marketing. We'll call it a B Corp, um, uh, so that it sounds like official and credible and all that's not like a sunny, happy day corporation or an inclusive corporation. It's, there's C Corps, now there's B Corps. Um, and and, let's, and uh, let's build a movement of those businesses so that they can, with collective voice, uh, have an impact on changing public policy, on changing consumption behavior patterns on changing where people choose to go to work and therefore what companies need to do in order to attract workers um, and how they treat their workers. Uh, and the change is investment patterns because uh, you know what matters in business in the end is how much capital flows to it from investors to, to allow business to scale. Um, and so that's the basic idea behind the B Corp movement. We started about six and a half years ago. Today there are about a thousand companies in 32 countries around the world that are certified B Corps. For them to be certified, it means that they have met a very high set of social and environmental performance standards, of transparency, and of legal accountability. They've expanded their legal accountability to include the consideration of all of their stakeholders when they make decisions, not just their shareholders. So if that's how a B Corp is different, Melissa, how is a worker-owned co-op different from your average company or business? Uh, where to start? Let's see. Um, so the sort of the fundamental unit of participation in a worker co-op is membership in the co-op. Um, and, and I might want to back the question up a little bit or give a little bit of additional context. I'll start small and then back up. Um, so what membership means is that member, is that ownership is shared among members equally and that surplus is distributed back to members equally. Um, and in that sense, it's an you know, extremely simple mechanism. It gets complicated with democratic governance and um, we're sort of considering the, um, the values and principles that also animate the cooperative form are fundamentally different from um, profit maximization values and principles. Um, and I think something I picked up on in what you were saying is this sort of credibility for impact. Um, the story of worker co-ops is this sort of of, of recent worker co-op organizing is this sort of ragtag band of misfits comes together to create a national organization and um, you know and sort of then finds itself in the middle of a movement um, and I don't think that's by accident but that's I think the perception of worker co-ops and so there has been this um, Steve Dawson at Co-op Home Care Associates says if you just keep doing the same thing for 30 years, you're on the cutting edge once every 30 years. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's sort of where we are now. This recent iteration of worker co-op organizing is the cutting edge. Um, and there's a, a fundamental shift in who's involved in worker cooperatives. Um, and I've seen it you know, profoundly over the last 10 years, but I think it extends further back into the 90s. Um, and that is, you know, in the 70s, a lot of democratic work place organizing was by middle class people looking to exit the mainstream economy and create an alternative. And what we're seeing in the last 20 years 
is democratic workplace organizing is done by people who want to enter the mainstream economy and on terms that actually create benefit and value within their communities. Um, and so there's a demographic shift there, but there's also, I think, pretty profound movement implications. How many co-ops do you represent? How many are in your federation? Uh, our membership is about 120 worker co-ops now. We think that there are between three and 400 worker co-ops in the country, although I, I'm guessing that's an undercount. Um, just because we don't know all of the recent organizing. And you want to give us an idea of what kinds of companies we're talking about? Sure. Yeah, primarily service sector, um, you know, retail, care economy. Um, there are some manufacturing co-ops, um, particularly in food manufacturing. Um, and, and those are a vest a lot, several of them are a vestige of organizing in the 80s around workplace buyouts. Um, which sort of connects to the ESOP movement, employee stock ownership plans. There was a sort of a you know, more industrial strategy and a job retention strategy in the 80s or manufacturing. We're going to get into much more detail about worker co-ops in, in, in just a second. But I want to bring Kelly in. And I need for that, for all of you to cooperatively pass one microphone down here. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly, talk us a little, describe for us where exactly it is that you work and what it is that you do and how you can. Sure. Uh, well, we are uh, placed in, based in Hunts Point, which has the distinction of still remaining to be the uh, nation's poorest congressional district, believe it or not, um, right here in our backyard. And um, when we're talking about this, we're talking about issues of systemic generational poverty that have nothing to do with or are, are non-attached to any types of dips and dives in a recession. This is beyond a recession. So we're looking at systemic issues. And uh, you know, essentially, the point is an, an ABCD, and it's an asset-based community development corporation. So unlike your traditional uh, service model, which, is, which often takes a deficit approach of what is wrong? Something's wrong, and we need to go fix it. Not that, uh, as opposed to an A, B, C, D approach of, you know, what are the assets in this particular uh, community and area, and understanding that the solutions to all of the problems are coming from within that particular community, um, and the largest asset of any business is actually human capital, right? So there are people in the community. So it's, you know, really countering. It, it sounds revolutionary, but it's been happening for decades um, and happens all over the place. So we're just a little uh, microcosm in Hunts Point. And our work is transformative, it's justice-based, and it's sustainable. And it happens through three pathways of youth development, community development, and arts and culture. And if you look in the middle of that, that's our sweet, sweet, sweet spot in all of our programs, really combine and integrate all of those things, yes, at the same time. And it's very hard to separate one from another because we believe that it is, that it is an integrated approach that really um, creates the most sustainable impact and change. So um, our programs sort of uh, fall in that sweet spot. Uh, they range from you know, a teen program called Action, um, uh, youth empowerment project, all really aimed at creating um, a really staunch and vibrant creative class as a way out of generational poverty. And we do these things not in isolation, but we do believe in movement building. But in order to sustain and see the benefits of a movement, you need little things like after school programs so that people can actually work and eat and <laughs> the communities can thrive. So it is a simultaneous approach of, of micro, that, that is the day-to-day, -day, the mundane, you know, that we run a really good quality after-school program, that we run an excellent out-of-school time program, and that we do this on a consistent basis so that our community is resilient enough to participate in the macro conversations that we're also connected in, in terms of wealth creation and economic democracy. So by doing this mundane work on a day-to-day -day basis, we create the relationships and the trust of our community members so that when we're inviting them to an economic democracy workshop, all right, like 
what does that even mean? You know, what does that mean to someone who may not even have the literacy level to read that, right? But they come, and they come because of those sustainable relationships that we're developing with the consistent um, delivery model uh, of these programs. So you have action. We also, um, women's youth empowerment programs, we also believe in investing in our young people in that we actually hire them. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so it's not just about what, you know, come to our program because we have all this. It's, it's also about a reciprocal relationship of valuing what they bring to the table as members of our organization. So they work with, with us, actually, and we pay them. And that's a direct way uh, that we show our investors, like, hey, you invest in us, we're investing right back into the community. Um, and then we also provide them with direct links. Like we put two uh, groups of young people uh, that want to start cooperatives through Omar uh, Fiera's Green Workers Co-op Academy. And we will continue to do this. So we also encourage entrepreneurship and ownership as opposed to just assuming that they're going to be, you know, some, you know, a, a worker that they should also think about being that business owner. And so I think... Talk a little bit more about the assets that you have. I mean, not only does it break down the stereotype of what exists in Hunts Point in the Bronx, but you are talk when we talked earlier, you talked about being able to draw on generational experience and understanding of the economy, some, some generational skills, um, and also, well, you have some other assets. You have a, a place. Well, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, we you know... We are uh, adjacent to the Bronx River. Um, we, we have uh, a ton of natural resources. We're also home to the world's second largest food distribution center. And you know the irony of that is that we have very little access to fresh food. I mean, this is the story of Hunts Point. And we have every single health disparity that you can think of. We also handle over 40% of the city's waste. Um, and you know, so when you when you look at those ironies, um, you also see opportunity, right? So for how you can reimagine these particular economies that have already naturally found themselves in Hunts Point. So how can we imagine reimagine the food-based economy to to be generative and to include, um, you know, the the folks in the community? How do you uh, reimagine, you know, the waste industry, right? Uh, to to be one that generates um, sustainable wages. And then also just the creation and the exportation of culture, you know, that the Bronx itself has created and exported into multi-trillion, bajillion dollar industries, I mean, everywhere around the world. You know, how do you sort of you still see that cultural sector as viable and as an opportunity that can be recaptured and um, sort of to, to create some, some wealth that stays in the community? I mean, all of these come with, uh, you know, what does that mean, nuts and bolts? Well, that means nuts and bolts operating a theater. You know, having a space for culture to happen, curating shows, um, not just in Hunts Point, but looking at that, creating that cultural capital worldwide, right? And then how do you recapture that? We're part of the Bronx Arts Alliance also, which for the first time tomorrow, there's going to be an opening at the Bronx Museum of the Arts because the Armory is finally having a Bronx Day. Go figure, you know? Um, so things like that. And I mean, the, uh, another threat that we talked about, threat, is you know, once you do well, you know, we, we can't rest too easy, right? Because once you create sort of a habit, you know, a really nice community, right? Okay, so we invest in like things like greenways and things like that. Okay, what happens? Property values, you know, rate, you know, da, 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 the cycle. I'm going to say the G word, right? Because then that came up. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when you improve your neighborhood? And this is something that our teenagers actually are questioning us on. You know, they're like, well, you know, we, we created all these greenways, and now we have trees and stuff like that, but am I going to be able to afford to live here now? And we can't safely say yes right now. And I think that that, you know, this is something I'm very happy Laura pressed me on when we spoke. You didn't actually say the G word, though. The gentrification, yes, gentrification. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say it because... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which yes, yes, Spike spoke at Pratt, um, which is actually, I'm attending right now too. So um, so yes, the G word, and it's inevitable, and it's, and it's sort of, it has to be at the cornerstone of this conversation, because in terms of wealth 
creation and ownership, right? I think traditionally we've thought about wealth creation and ownership in terms of housing only. And I think we've seen how detrimental that it, that was and that we lost almost all of the wealth that we've accumulated because of that because it was so tied up just in home ownership. So I think that this new model is essential because it's giving us an alternative. Jay Kelly, and a fantastic graduate of the Gritty Media Training Program, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> <laughs> give, give her feedback because she was my coach. <laughs> Let's come to you, Melissa, because I'm hearing, um, well, I was just in Jackson, and the mayor there talked about we want to, the mayor, Mayor Shokwe Lumumba, talked about we want to have urban renewal without urban removal. And the role that he was going to be able to play as not only a landowner, the city owning thousands of acres of land, but as an asset owner in that the city had raised revenues to perform much needed public works, rebuilding the infrastructure, water and sewer, and he was going to use that money he planned, his administration continues to plan, to use that money to support locally owned businesses and low barrier to entry worker-owned co-ops and, and companies. It made me think about the relationship between policy and the people. Um, Melissa, where do you see policies making for a inclusive, eco uh, inclusive economy friendly environment? Well, I think policy is the critical next stage in the building or evolution of an ecosystem that's going to support shared ownership. Um, I mentioned ESOPs earlier. I think we can. Um, and I don't want to get Just remind people what those too into are. the weeds with ESOPs, but yeah, they're employee stock ownership plans. It's a form of shared ownership of a business that doesn't necessarily attach to democratic governance. There's a trust mechanism that owns shares and employees own the trust. Um, and it, you know, it's it's um, wildly successful um, in terms of broad-based shared ownership. And part of what ESOPs were able to do was get written in, get legislation written in the 70s. Um, that that supported the form. So at the federal level, you know, it's a technically a retirement vehicle. Um, and so I think one one lesson we can take from ESA, and, and you know, now they're forever defending it, like you know, constantly. <laughs> that's the nature of their policy work. Um, but you know, that's what happens when you get something that that works and is valuable. So I think there's a direct federal and probably state and local level policy supports that can. Um, that can be initiated to support worker ownership. But I think I'm interested in thinking sort of a little bit more abstractly about it at an ecosystem level, not just how do we create more worker co-ops and how does policy mandate that or support it, but um, what kind of policies do we have to move to create the system, the ecosystem that's going to um, allow sort of scale and flourishing. And, uh, you know, I think We'll just take a couple examples because those are pretty illustrative. So Cooperative Home Care Associates here in the Bronx is working at, and, and has um, replicated a, a project in Philadelphia as well, home care workers. 25 years old, 2,000 employees. 2,500 now. 2,500, the biggest in the country. Right, the largest worker co-op in the country looking to double in the next few years, actually. And, and part of that, is, I mean, that's entirely an intentional strategy in order to have to be able to survive in the industry, but also to affect the working conditions in the industry. Um, but you know, the, it's it's a fairly terrible industry, and it's um, the uh, pay rate of workers is directly determined by the state reimbursement rate. So there's a policy there that, that you, you cannot responsibly create a worker co-op in the home care industry without engaging. In, in healthcare policy, at least in that very bite-sized level, and probably at a, at a, you know with a broader lens. Um, and then I think that there's the sort of other example that we can look at. Um, it, it, Jackson is a very is a pretty clear. I mean, this it's so exciting because you know you've got a friendly city government, which we say, oh, if only we had a friendly city government, what could we do? And similarly, what's going on in New York City is 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 you know I think has a lot of potential. Um, if we look at Cleveland, the Evergreen Cooperatives, which I think most people are, are people familiar with the Evergreen Cooperative Project? Okay, it's a um, place-based asset, um, uh, sorry, anchor institution strategy to sort of leverage the jobs created by anchor institutions to create worker co-ops, and, and there's a lot more to it. Um, but they could not have built that model without city economic development participation. And it wasn't that the city said, we're going to create a grant program, and you're going to get a staffer, and you know, 
there are going to be city loans or zoning, whatever. There, those things did move, but what they first said was, you're going to get a staffer. And then that person will help bring in federal money, will look at the various zoning pieces, will look at, you know, what needs to happen for this scaled system to, to succeed. Um, so that, you know, and, and then the sort of the, one of the brass rings is procurement policy. And I think that's what the folks at BCDI are working on is how do you move, if you think of anchors within a city as not just the private institutions, but the city itself, and this is the Jackson model, um, how do you move that purchasing to worker co-ops or shared ownership entities? Let's unpack that a little bit more. We just did a show with some of the participants in a New York City council hearing that took place last week. Extraordinarily oversubscribed, two rooms packed, city council meeting um, convened by uh, Maria Carmen del Arroyo from the Bronx, who had heard this report from the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies um, be released and got all inspired about worker co-ops, convened this hearing and was basically asking what does city need to change in terms of its policies um, to facilitate the growth of worker-owned co-ops that we agree can reduce inequality and poverty and lift families uh, higher up the, 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 towards economic stability. In terms of concrete changes, um, Andrew, let's start with you. What would need to change for B Corps? Or what did you need to change in the sort of typical structure of a company to create a Corp legally and then I'd love to hear from you Melissa or Yeoman on what needs to change policy wise concretely uh, to make cooperatives be able to apply for government contracts and so on so on the on the B Corp front I mean, let me start by saying that we sort of have tended to think about policy as kind of two different things one is about corporate law which is state which is governed by states so there's actually 50 different versions of corporate law in the US um, and then we've tended to think about policy in terms of like incentives, municipal, state, federal, uh, what are the kinds of things that will um, facilitate business being able to be done in a different way. So on the, on the first part of that, what we realized um, a few years into our work was that uh, there was enough, there was a total lack of clarity about what's allowed under the law in various, in sort of state by state, and particularly in the states that really matter from the perspective of mainstream finance, like Delaware. Many of you know it. Delaware is the home of corporate law in the U.S. Most companies down, aren't actually in Delaware, but they're all incorporated in Delaware, particularly if they've gone public or have venture capital or, or public, um, uh, public capital. And so um, we realized we needed to actually create a new corporate form. The existing corporate form uh, was structured in such a way uh, and had so many people guarding it that we were never going to get anybody to change existing corporate law to say that all companies have to behave in a different way. And so we said, at least for as a start, let's create an alternative. And people who want to choose that alternative can, can do so, so that we basically create a freer market at some level. More businesses and more investors can choose to do business in a different way. Um, and, and then we'll see from there whether that can lead to, like, you know, whether that can co-opt mainstream uh, corporate behavior. Or, or what you have to do next, how that maybe gets paired with regulation, or what, what examples are created. Um, and so the way we did that was to say, we need a new corporate form. And we sat down with a bunch of lawyers, and we had them literally like write out, if you wanted a company that was more inclusive under the law, that had to consider the interests of all of its stakeholders, that had to create public benefit in addition to shareholder value, what would it look like? And we came up with like some a few specific provisions that would be different than existing corporate law. The first one is that the purpose of the corporation itself has to be different. And so the Benefit Corp law, which is what it's called, the Model Benefit Corp Act, says that the purpose of the corporation is to create a material positive impact on society and the environment um, uh, through both its, its the business's uh, practices and its profits. Um, so that's like a different purpose to the corporation. Now, you can have a company with a different purpose, but uh, if there's no accountability and no transparency about whether it's actually achieving that purpose, then it doesn't really mean much. And so the other provisions that have been put into the Benefit Corp Act are meant to sort of back up that purpose. The first one um, uh, is about uh, transparency. So these companies have to measure themselves against third-party standards on their social and environmental impact, and they have to report on that publicly. 
So you know, as a consumer or an investor, that one of these companies um, is actually creating the impact or not that, uh, that it claims to be creating. And then the third thing is accountability. Great to have a lot of information. If you can't do anything about it, it doesn't really mean much. And so um, just like you can sue a regular company, for a breach of fiduciary duty, like if you think the directors or the officers are squandering the profits of the company, you can sue a benefit corp for failing to create positive social environmental impact. Uh, and so it's those things together, purpose, account purpose transparency, accountability, uh, are like the you know, belts and suspenders that are meant to, to make that company um, actually do what it said it was going to do. Now, those benefit corp laws, that's just a new corporate form. It doesn't actually, I mean, the companies today don't get any benefits from doing that other than um, other than an ability to act in a different way if they choose to. And so the, the, the next, I think, stage in policy is to think about what are the things that would actually now uh, incentivize more companies to, um, uh, more companies to incorporate that way, to choose to behave in a different way, and what would incentivize more investors to put their capital to work in those. And we can spend some more time on it, but I think you know, there, there, are, there are procurement preferences, there's taxation of the corporation, there's investment uh, credits or, um, or taxing uh, uh, income and gains on investments in those businesses differently than, uh, than traditional businesses. And so there's a, there's a range, I think, now of policy opportunities to pursue um, based on using that new corporate form and those performance standards. Melissa? Uh, well, as Andrew was speaking, I was reminded that we actually already have, worker co-ops actually already have a massive policy win yeah. um, that, you know, to, to, let's not be historically amnesiac, you know, 100 years ago or whenever, um, the cooperative form was written into the tax code with a, at, at the federal level with subchapter T um, that, you know, in, in such a way that allows surplus to be distributed to members without being taxed at the corporate level. And when I talk to people about this who are looking at projects at scale, they're, this is like huge that, you know, our largest and most successful worker co-ops are retaining millions of dollars in their businesses year over year in individual member capital accounts. So rather than that surplus being taxed, um, as, you know, the corporate level is distributed back. So, and that's, a, that's an explicit acknowledgement that it's a member benefit form that has a community benefit principle attached to it. So, um, I think actually we should be protecting that and pumping it up and sort of sharing it as really a, a pretty critical part of the form that we've already got. Um, now the like ability of the IRS and other federal agencies to actually understand and help us protect that is a whole other thing. And that has to do with education and relationship building and, and political power. But it's there, it's on the books, let's use it. Um, I think we can learn a lot from ESOPs about how they have gotten preferences um, you know, in the, in the tax code with the DOL and SBA, there are ways to um, increase the parity of worker co-ops with ESOPs. Um, I think we can learn a lot from BLABS about, about the kind of incentives and, um, uh, you know, the, the power of a certification in, in laying the groundwork for incentives. Um, and if we kind of look at the low-hanging fruit, the local first movement, minority-owned business status, these are things that also already exist that could be attached to a worker cooperative form. Um, one thing I think to note, uh, a couple recent co-op development initiatives, Push Buffalo in Buffalo and the Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative in Cincinnati, um, are both started their co-op development in initiatives, not with actually creating businesses, but with looking at the policy landscapes that were going to matter for the businesses that they created. So if they're going to build a market for a weatherization business, part of building that protected market is making sure that at the city level there's a preference for ethical businesses. You know, not explicitly for worker co-ops because they're trying to build a coalition, but worker co-ops would certainly score pretty high um, on, you know, in the same way worker co-ops off the charts of some parts of the B-Lab certification, it's just a natural, a natural fit. So kind of looking at what's already there, I think, is really critical for us right now. Um, and, I'll, and I'll say that's because when we think of worker co-op development, we sort of think in two strands, there's widespread entrepreneurship, what do you do to make that easier for people? But there's also this sort of development model, which is meant to address the multiple vulnerabilities um, in, in the workforce, um, and in the in you know creating businesses and trying to build wealth, um, I'll talk more about that. Later. You know, I mean, we already have um, minority-owned business, women-owned business, 
um, categories that are supposed to benefit women, um, women business owners and, and people of color. A lot of the co-ops that we're talking about are actually run by women of color. Um, why do you need more change from the city? And what do you need to change? Well, uh, just step back a bit. Um, so one of the, before I start saying some ideas, one of the, just some of the things I want to acknowledge, is especially in New York City, or specifically in New York City, I think it's been about 20 years since we could seriously have this conversation. <laughs> um, so I think just one pausing, and there's a lot of ideas we haven't really come up with yet because this wasn't so front and center or such a focal point. I mean, towards the end of the administration, I think there was some conversation about how best, use, most profitable most profitable and best use for land as the main real estate driven economic policy uh, was not benefiting all areas in New York City. I think towards the end of the, the, the last administration that I was going to talk, but that idea was still very marginal and, and, and put aside now, I think um, it's a bit different and, and that's given and we're, you know, we're poised to come up with real forward thinking ideas. So one, I, I think um, there's just a lot of stuff we haven't thought about yet, and in this context, um, if we can real, if we could bring and bridge and build real multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-faceted collaboratives, uh, I'm hopeful that real forward thinking ideas will be born from this. So I just want one wanted to say that, um, but but two, I mean, and I don't, at, at risk of, of being really unpopular, and in some circles when I talk about this. Uh, it, that that usually happens. We can we can have all the jobs. A, a community could be fully employed and still uh, have generational poverty. Yeah. A community could be fully employed and still produce toxic waste and eventually pollute themselves to uh, to the point where they can no longer exist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can have you know every person of color. With a job, you know, and still have those those things happening in the community. So we just have to, I think, have more um, forward-thinking, realistic metrics that are tied to social equity um, and and collective uh, prosperity. Um, and there, I, and I think we have some opportunities to do that. Um, you know, specifically in in New York City, our planning infrastructure. Is very exclusionary of local communities, right? It used to be that every community board had a planning person. They didn't have a lot of resources, but it's still every community board had uh, a sort of a planning uh, mechanism, and that was one way where communities can come together and uh, and begin to you know plan and shape their communities. I think we need to do do more things like that and give it a real steroid shot and build uh, uh, real planning capacity in, in, in New York City that, that brings to the, together local communities. And that was one of the major learning that we, we got from, from Mondrago, um, which is why, you know, at least for BCDI, one of the things we're trying to build is what we call the Community Enterprise Network, right, which is a network of CBOs, financial institutions, anchor institutions, right, like, like with, with Cleveland, et cetera, that come together and coordinate their activities uh, and try to affect the investment patterns of local institutions and, and local players and shift them to uh, build things that build collective wealth and collective ownership. So anyway, I think there is, uh, is, is, um, is, there's an opportunity. I think when, when we think of policy, um, local procurement policy, not just with the city, right? Everything we buy, where does it come from? What are the opportunities to build local capacities to to, to supply that? But also with institutions. Um, so I think you know there's 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 opportunities and, and changes there where we can uh, build collective wealth and collective ownership. I think the other thing that's really key um, is in education. <laughs> so you know five maybe a little longer, six years ago, I wasn't talking about worker cooperatives. I mean, the worker cooperatives were like, is, is sort of like an esoteric, mystical 
thing, right? Like when I first found out about it, it was like, oh wow, this is magic. Like I never, I haven't I heard of this before, you know? Um, so I think education is a real opportunity for us to start, uh, you know, making workplace democracy more more mainstream or a part of the of, of, of our education. And the only other thing I want to say on that um, is our community stakeholders with, which drive PCDI and, you know, the point Kelly is, is, you know, is a part of it. You know, one of the things that happened was um, folks, you know, folks were saying if we really want our members to to be a part of to, to be a part of executing the changes we want to see in the world, some real education and local capacity building needs to happen. And that's why, you know, one of the things we had to do was build what we call economic democracy training series curriculum that Kelly, you know, mentioned before. Thank, thanks for that. Um, well, let's to, to do that. Sorry. I mean, I want to bring open this up to questions in just a second. So prepare your questions and we'll hand around a mic so that your questions get on the live stream. But I don't want to end without giving you a chance. We've talked a little bit about what some alternatives are that are already out there, how they could be bigger and better, how we could, outside of these individual institutions, perhaps help us helping to step, helping to influence policy. Um, now I want you just briefly to give us your biggest frigging annoying challenge. And not just annoying, but huge problem. Because we're all trying to create an inclusive economy or a cooperative economy in our exclusive, globalized, capitalist system, is it even possible? Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't say yes or no. What are you up against? What's the biggest thing you're up against? Yeah. <laughs> Piece of cake. Well, first of all, we have the solutions right in our own community. So that's something that we understand and we know. So we have the capital. So the question is, how do you create a sustainable uh, flow, right, to keep the development of this capital possible, right, on a long-term basis, on a long-term basis? So looking at more sustainable makeups of our enterprise, I think, is something that we're really investigating. I really liked your emphasis on the mundane. Yeah. And when we talked, you talked about we need. <laughs> Supports. Yes. Mundane supports. Yes. The, the after school program is not sexy. And when you think about the after school program, you're not thinking about, oh, economic democracy and uh, economic development. So the one thing I will challenge us is to, to really, when we're thinking about what vehicles, what are the delivery systems for all of the theoretical things that we're talking about right now? What are the, the reliable delivery, delivery systems to think outside the box, to include community-based grassroots organizations. It's not just going to be an RFP from EDC that, you know, how does that, how does that get bid out? You know, what is that? You know, the, the lowest bidder, you know, gets that bid. And they don't even, you know, what, what are the matrix, right, for how you measure what's going to be effective? And then how do you measure effectiveness? But how many people are served? So what? You know, like, so what? You serve 2,000 people. You know, um, they walk through your doors, they walk back out, and we're still poor 20 years later. You know, so what's your ROI and what is your end game? You know, so I think that <clears throat> we really need to flip um, what, who we perceive to be the vehicles and the movers and the changers for all of these really big macro ideas. Who are, who is best suited to actually implement these things, that's who we, we need to change who we think that is. And I'm going to say it's community-based organizations. And then one thing I want to hop on with Yurman, he didn't say right out that what we need to change is our city charter. <laughs> okay, well, we can do that. Um, <laughs> Andrew, then Melissa, Yurman, then we come to the audience. Uh, gosh, this is hard. Um, I think... For us, uh, the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, we think we're trying to build a global movement to redefine success in business. So uh, that means trying to figure out how to scale, um, and scale as a small nonprofit uh, means trying to figure out how to move from, I guess I would describe it as basically retail to wholesale. So this is like, for us as an organization, the biggest question is, how, you know, if we want to certify many more companies instead of a thousand if we want ten thousand B Corps and instead of fifteen thousand companies that are using our 
standards to measure to measure and improve their impact. We want that to be a hundred thousand companies, so that we're having a much broader impact on companies trying to trying to do something uh, more useful. Then we need to move from retail to wholesale. So that means uh, you know partnerships uh, with lots of organizations that are working with businesses in in communities, uh, both local communities and global communities, um, and then. Sort of at the very other end of the spectrum, there's a huge risk, I think, in trying to scale a, a movement of losing all sense of like concrete on the ground local impact. And so for us, a big challenge is at the same time, whether it's through those partnerships uh, with local organizations or through our own standards, is making sure that we're sort of going deep, building a greater, a, a bigger root system and one that's actually having an impact on the lives of the workers or the communities um, where, uh, where all of these companies actually do their business. Jorman, actually, let's have you come in here and give Melissa the last word. Yeah, uh, I really want to um, second what, what Kelly said. I think my biggest sort of challenge or our biggest challenge of frustration um, comes in trying to articulate or sell the importance of community-based organizations. One as a, the, you know, one of the delivery sort of mechanisms. Um, but two as just critical to, to developing local economy, period. I'll give just one concrete example. We're working with uh, a group called Black Power. They have this interesting way to finance energy retrofit. It's, 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 it, it, um, it's rooted in bringing faith-based organizations together to, to structure a deal. So we're, one of our core partners is the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, a faith-based organization. Um, so you know, one of the things that's critical to structuring the deal and to get local people in the community hired to, to do the, the, the retrofits is organizing these churches and bringing them together so that they can survive, uh, survive the deal because there's a whole bunch of trust implications Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the only, the only, the only entity that really holds those relationships and holds that trust and holds that talent in house is the Northwest Bonds Community Encouragement Coalition. And in talking and in, in generating support specifically for this project, it's really easy to say, you know, yeah, uh, you know, fund the business analysis. Yes, fund uh, these these other nuts and bolts thing. And but it's been really difficult uh, to convince people <laughs> to support the organizing, which is critical uh, to me the most important part without it 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 doesn't even doesn't even happen additionally um, around education the only entities and mechanisms in our communities where they can actually deliver in easily in an easily digestible form these theories and these concepts are and and the talent to do it is in community organizations um, and it's for some reason, I don't know, it's been very, very frustrating and difficult uh, to convince folks um, of that. I mean, we get it. You know, the folks in the now, we totally get it. Um, but everywhere else, it seems, it seems mystical. It seems, um, it seems too risky, so to, sp so to speak. But, it, I mean, it's either it, it's there or it's not going to happen. And I think that's what we've seen. So anyway, that's like my, my biggest frustration. Melissa, you talked about ownership when we talked. Yeah. So... We're fundamentally trying to democratize ownership of capital in a system that not only doesn't really make that easy, but is actually designed to do the, the opposite, right? To concentrate capital in. And, um, so that's a that's a hard thing, right? How, how do we how do we do that? Um, and I think you know if I can just steal from Audrey Lord, um, can we use the master's tools to do this? You know, can we put the master's tools in a new tool belt? I don't know what the metaphor would be, but we have to use some of the tools. We have to use them in a smart way and with a different set of principles and values guiding them. Um, and I guess what I see when I talk about the multiple vulnerabilities in creating cooperative businesses, um, they're, they're across the board. Um, and, and so when I guess our challenge is to create an ecosystem that supports scale which itself helps support the, the further development of worker co-ops. That's policy, that's capital that looks really different. Um, that's protected markets, it's networks of support, 
It's training and education of the, the sort that you folks in the Bronx are doing. It's the cultural component. Um, you know, and, and all of those things have to look very different from how we understand them to operate right now. Um, but it's, a, it's an engagement with those tools. It really is, because we're not going to do it on um, volunteer labor and um, you know, uh, scrappy dreams alone. We have, to get, we have to get our hustle on and really figure out how these things work. You know, and and the, the community organizing is difficult, and business development is difficult, and putting them together is like maybe the hardest thing you can do. So I invite you to join us in that labor. All right. <laughs> Well, I'll just make a pitch for media. When I was interviewing the council member this week, and I asked her, you know, about the educational tools in her, in her toolbox as the new chairman of the Committee for Community Development of the New York City Council, um, and what media access she had, she said, well, I have access to you, she said, you know, a small independent media company. When we talk about education, I would just put in a little pitch that media needs to be part of that. All right, questions um, from folks. Yeah, in the back there. Let's get the streaming mic yeah. over to our friend here. And maybe just tell us who you are before you give us your question. Thank you. Um, before joining City in December, is this on? Just mm -hmm. going to the stream. Okay. You're not going to hear it amplified. Um, I spent 10 years with the New York City Department of Small Business Services. So I, I wanted to offer a couple of practical suggestions on the procurement side, if that's appropriate. I, I hear your frustration. I shared some of the frustrations even, you know, working with procurement officers in the city's buying system. The current MWBE certification process is just not practical for what I'm, what little I'm hearing. I, I don't know a lot about worker-owned cooperatives and I'm really excited to learn more. But if you've got 50 or 100 owners, um, it's hard enough for someone with one or two or three owners to get through the process. So you want to talk to the council and the folks from the new administration about how could that process be streamlined for multiple owners, I think. Um, also, if there's any thoughts to the local preferences, the city is subject to state procurement law. So those local preferences, I believe, would have to be legislated in Albany. Um, there's a body called the Procurement Policy Board that meets, I think, quarterly. You need to get to them to change any of the specific rules. And another big frustration I had was, well, the city buys, what, 13 to $16 billion of goods and services every year? 16. So 30% of that, roughly, is uh, goes to nonprofits for human services. Because they're nonprofits and there's not the same ownership type structure, even if there are subcontracting opportunities, there aren't, let's say, MWBE goals or local goals against those contracts. So figuring out a way, and, and you know, you mentioned the um, home healthcare workers. That's a great example where a large non nonprofit might get a contract for something like that. But what's their incentive to subcontract to a local company? So um, for what it's worth, I also think education is critical because it is such a complicated and frustrating process. Who buys what, where, and how? And how are those decisions made? Another question over here. Maybe we could move a couple of mics around. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Larry Kleinman. I work with the Capaces Leadership Institute in Oregon. Happy to be here, and Kolu invited me to come. Thank you for that. Um, so in all the presentations and comments so far, I haven't heard the word unions said. So I'm interested to know if any of the panelists have a take on where you think unions fit in the present and the future. And secondly, an area I work in a lot is the coming legalization of 11 million people, which, notwithstanding the politics of today, I believe, and many others believe, is inevitable. Um, we've crossed over the tipping point. It's now just a question of how and when. So what is that going to mean, also? Where does that fit in the mix of the, of the rearrangement of economic relationships? Hmm. Great question. Who wants to respond? So um, there is a, there a, a, at the, in a few different areas, and sort of at the beginning to be at the national level, there are some conversations around union worker co-ops. Um, the problem, uh, we'll start with the problem and then get to the exciting part. In the 80s, with the buyouts of, of manufacturing, um, unions uh, got screwed, to be honest, um, and vulgar, sorry. It was uh, um, in, with worker buyouts, um, 
they, you know, they were they weren't successful for the most part. And then, you know, they were trying to do a lot of really hard things. So there's sort of this within unions and um, steel workers in particular, there was this sort of like, well, we got burns. Let's not try to do that. That didn't work. There's a new kind of generation of thinking, and the steel workers are leading it around um, creating a union co-op form. So they have written some foundational documents. They're working on a collective bargaining agreement. There are a few um, initiatives around the country. Cincinnati's one of them. I mentioned that. Um, looking at you know how you can sort of do startups or buyouts that of unionized workplaces. Um, it's you know it's at the early stages of thought. I will say the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain, which has interest in the U.S., um, is particularly interested in um, allying with unions because, in their view, that's sort of the container for solidarity consciousness in the U.S. To the extent that it exists on a large scale, it's in unions, and so you know they see the need for a cultural shift and that kind of the the, the consciousness piece in developing democratic workplaces. They see it in unions. Um, it, I, I would say it's still really early stages, but there's an active discussion within our federation and our work about the role of unions. Yeah, I mean, I think um, unions have built over a uh, long period of time tremendous infrastructure for workplace democracy. So, for example, you know, the largest, right, the largest worker on cooperative in the country is Cooperative Home Care Associates, right? They're also <laughs> they're also all affiliated with 1199. They're all 1199 members. 1199 is, is a core uh, core member of BCDI, by the way. Um, and when you think about uh, as a home care business, I want to impact the industry. I want to like get the industry to be better. One of the things I think that's important and that can be leveraged um, with labor with union labor unions is the incredible infrastructure they've built in getting at like policy changes and legisl legislation changes happening in local city and uh, state and, and federal levels. Um, so I think you know labor has a huge role to play as far as advancing, solidifying and building the, the mechanisms to sustain workplace democracy. Um, There's also the, an, another uh, sort of flip side to it in Jackson where you're in a right to work state and a lot of union folks are saying, okay, this is this kind of work is an opportunity for us to have some workers to have some power and control in the workplace that we can't get any other way. Unions also have a lot of capital and, and can drive a lot of things through their investment decisions. Questions? Uh, hey, you guys, I'm Hugh from the North. Star Fund, um, sort of living in the nexus of trying to figure out how to fund community organizing and, and new economy initiatives. Um, for those of us that spend time in the food space of late and philanthropy, what keeps coming up is this whole issue of the beyond the power of a Cargill or, or a Monsanto is the pressure on local um, artisanal food businesses or uh, entrepreneurs of color or, or uh, immigrant entrepreneurs who get into the value-added food production space and the pressure of holding companies and kind of the upward movement of capital into vertically integrated global systems. So I was just wondering if that pressure is also felt in, in the B Corp movement or what, what mostly you guys are doing or even Kelly, Kelly and uh, Yorm and what you're experiencing at the local level because it's we're realizing more and more there, one of the farmers that we talked to after Irene and Sandy was talking about how in the old days in the farm system no one felt the pressure to get big. And now it's all about how do I how do I get bigger and then how do I sell out? Um, so I'm just curious if you could talk about that a little bit and how the values propositions and the question of scale, like what that means to our work together. And then secondly, I just was curious where you guys felt like philanthropy was delivering somehow because we've been talking a lot about mission-related investing and impact investing as the next generation of socially responsible investing. And it seems like there's energy, but I'm just curious if that's making it to your work or people are interested in building relationships and ac actually moving capital. Because we keep hearing, hearing this problem of there's not deal-ready stuff in the, in the new economy, local economy frame. I mean, I'm happy to respond to the, I, I think you're asking about sort of how to, how to small um, mission-driven entrepreneurs, people who've chosen to, to try to build a business in order to address a address a problem, uh, how do they maintain that mission? Um, and do they get 
basically forced into trying to scale and then sell, or is there a different way for them to sort yeah, of hold on and, yeah. and and build a build an ecosystem of smaller businesses? Um, uh, and it's I think a pretty hard one. I mean, the the fact is that most businesses in the U.S. are small businesses, and uh, and 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 there's a huge movement. I would say the responsible business movement is made up of lots of different little of lots of different sort of subsets and you know one of them is all about local so there's you know an organization called Bali the business business alliance for local living economies that's got now I don't know 30,000 plus businesses and a bunch of chapters all over the country um, and their whole focus is all about local it's about maintaining you know small like figuring out how to build small businesses that can that can maintain size aren't necessarily trying to scale outside of the communities that they're in, but making those businesses healthy by driving you know, local supply chains, local consumption, local job creation. Um, and I think there is a there's a decent amount of health to that movement because it's got because um, the stakeholders who support those businesses want to see uh, that maintained. So it, the, the the challenge is when those businesses the people who own them do decide that they want to scale. Uh, and then they're, you know, moving outside of those communities and they have to attract capital. And I think that's the place where they tend to suffer the most. Is if, if they're going to sell out to a, a, you know, a big company, Unilever or whoever, uh, or if they're going to, um, uh, or if they're going to try to bring in, you know, private equity capital or, or eventually be able to go public, then that's where a lot of the you know, the the soul and the mission goes away, and that's part of what we're trying to address with companies being able to become B Corps. One thing I would say that has been interesting to me to watch is there has been, you know, there was this long history of like Ben and Jerry's selling to Unilever, and like a, there's a long sort of set of t tales of woe of of um, uh, of these sort of mission-driven businesses selling out. And I do think that there's a more sophisticated next generation of entrepreneurs who are figuring out how to raise mission aligned capital and even sell uh, and, and take some money off the table. It's not the worst thing in the world for people to actually make some money in their lives. Um, but do that without the businesses selling out. Um, and and, uh, and like the, the legal forms are one way of doing that, but I think so is some of the transparency where they basically force it on the buyer or on the investor. They say, great, you want a piece of this business, then it's going to be a benefit corp. Uh, it's going to be transparent about its social and environmental impact. I'm still going to be a shareholder in it. And so if you decide to try to throw all that stuff out the window, I'm going to rake you over the coals publicly because all that information is transparent. And interestingly, I think some of those companies Campbell's just, I'm sorry to go on, but one, one last point. Campbell's just bought a company called Plum Organics. It's a baby food company, uh, which was scaling really quickly. Campbell's decided at the time of the acquisition, instead of just folding this company inside of Campbell's, to make it a benefit corp and hold it as a separate, separately wholly owned entity. Um, and they still have an objective of scaling it and all that stuff, so it won't be like too idealistic. Or, or naive about about the objectives, but it was basically, I think, almost like a statement of like, save us from ourselves. Mm. <laughs> you know, like we we want this business to maintain its mission because that's what attracts uh, high quality employees to it. That's what's going to maintain yeah. its its loyal consumer base. And so, um, and so they decided to hold it that way. And, and the entrepreneurs who were had built the business were part of forcing it to do that and like helping them to realize that's what's going to create value. So. Yeah. There are some stories of, of people doing going the other direction. In the first of the Commonomics series um, that we're doing with Yes Magazine, I wrote about Mark Tilson up on the Pine Ridge Reservation, started a company, the Tonka Bar Company, that was getting growing in size. Um, and at that point decided, well, if our mission is to keep resources on the reservation, we're going to sell this company to the owner, to the workers. We're going to create a cooperative. Um, it can go to whatever size it wants, but it's going to be cooperative, and that's he's getting help now from the Democracy Collaborative and others to, to make that happen. Um, hey, guys. So I wanted to ask a question that was sort of specific to this community. I mean, so much of what we've been talking about has been sort of what the, the city can do or um, what the corporate community can do. But what can the philanthropic community do, whether it's through the, the, the nature of our investment or through the leveraging of the social capital that we have out in the world? 
what would you uh, charge the philanthropic community to do to, to further the kind of work that you support? <laughs> Come on now, you're all prepared for this question. This actually go. This I, um, I'll, I'll go first, and then because um, I've been preparing for this question. Um, <laughs> not that you have it, but I've been thinking about it a lot. And um, and I think uh, it, to, to the to the questioner about um, MRIs and PRIs. I mean, so if we're thinking really about not um, structuring co-op development as one-off projects that get dumped into an unprotected market with less capital than they need and undertrained. If we're talking about not doing that, then what we are talking about is mobilizing significant resources to support large scale projects. Um, and, and by scale, I don't necessarily mean like size of enterprise. It can be a scale uh, network, you know. Um, but, and, and, <clears throat> and for that, you do need MRIs and PRIs because the tools that exist right now, um, at least in financing, Brendan in the working world, there may be one of the only financial institutions in the country willing to make high-risk loans um, to high-risk borrowers. Melissa, I'm sorry, but maybe there's somebody watching on the stream, like me, who's not 100% sure what an MRI, right. et cetera, is. OK. An MRI is a mission-related investment, and a PRI is a program-related investment. And to be honest, I don't know a whole lot more than that. Um, so I, you know, would, if, if people do want to speak to that more, more granular detail, I think it's important. But I, I guess what I want to say is um, there's a role for mitigating risk that foundations can play. Financial institutions can only take on through, you know, because of regulation and, and because of their own, um, you know, operating pressures, can only take on so much risk. And when we're talking about trying to build shared ownership and democratic ownership of capital in poor communities, those resources have to come from somewhere. And so, you know, whether it's first loss capital on risky loans, whether it's, um, you know, investments in infrastructure, um, it, I think thinking at an ecosystem level is where philanthropy should be around this stuff. Um, you know, and then, you know, secondarily, I think the the funding of the kind of work that will help um, create the protected markets and the policy changes that will support co-op development, I think it could be helpful. As you know, new economy, Laura and I were talking about this earlier, is a very general term. Um, we're, we're focusing in on it, I think. but. Um, it could be useful. I'm not suggesting everybody move there, put all their eggs in the worker co-op basket, but it could be a useful lens for focusing some of the policy and media work um, of new economy organizations to say, well, this is a thing that we can sort of get behind in a um, in a concrete way. Kelly? Yes. Um, beyond beyond funding us. Okay. Um, but no, seriously. Um, so there's a paradigm shift that that um, I I acknowledges in, in process and many of the investors here you know are familiar with us I mean, and in the way you're creating your investments are they're they're multi-year investments right and the ROIs and the SROIs that you're looking for aren't necessarily tied to like an annual fiscal year nor are they tied to you know a metrics that is looking at you know, scale, right? So in, in terms of uh, just, sim you know, looking at, well, how many are you serving, but, you know, what what are you doing with who you're serving as opposed to how many, right? And I think that, um, you know, also just as I said before, putting an emphasis on thinking outside of the box in terms of non-traditional delivery systems for economic and community development policy and initiatives, I think, is also uh, critical. You know, because you you also have to think of not only uh, you know up here, which is what the methodology is, right? Whether it is a worker or own co-ops or whatever, but you also need to think about the your target audience <laughs> and who's closest to that target audience, because you can put all your eggs in the basket in in terms of a wonderful organization that is all about you know the what. But in terms of the who, they don't have any relationships, so they have no context. So by the time, you know, you you invest in them, by the time they figure out that they need to partner with the community-based organizations <laughs> to get to those relationships, and then not pay them, right? Because this is what happens. This is what happens. We 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 will always do the work because that's what we do, 
and whether or not we're funded or we need to operate at a deficit or you know we have to take pay cuts to survive like we're going to survive because that is our mission and um, when we when we get called upon to connect larger initiatives like I, I'm thinking about like the, the rebuild by design work that's actually happening in terms of resiliency even like you need local stakeholders um, as a part of of that um, recipe so I say partnerships but also thinking about putting a value on that as capital so you know funding those partnerships and and really understanding that um, community-based knowledge should be also you know valued in the marketplace of ideas to add one other little layer to the Jackson story um, you know, the mayor was able to raise the revenue for the public works through persuading even his base of low-income African-American Jacksonians to vote for a sales tax. And he did that in part because he had put in place a system of popular public assemblies, people's assemblies, building an engagement with policymaking and with policymakers over his years as a council member. So that he had a direct mechanism of control that wasn't party-based, that wasn't through the elected officials, that was in the hands of the community in each ward. And that's where he and others of his administration went to discuss why they needed to pass this tax, what they would do with the money. And then those same entities, fora, will be the fora that keep the government accountable for how they spend that money. Uh, so there's a demo, demo, you know, democracy building piece which I think is worth mentioning in this context too. And then I have one last question before everybody leaves, which is just, this is the one area in my experience as a journalist, we have more time, but in case people have to leave. <laughs> this is one area in terms of my experience as a journalist where money and business and economics and women and people of color connect hugely. I mean, much of what we're talking about are agencies in charge, in, in the hands of women, and, and particularly women of color. And yet, most of our financial institutions and even our philanthropic institutions and our policy-making institutions are still dominated by white men, even in this area of solidarity economics and cooperatives and all the rest of it, much as we love Brenda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's heard me say it before. What gives? What difference does race and gender make in all of this? And um, how do we build on what's great and diminish what's not so great in those dynamics? I had the last hard question first. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I honestly have a response. I mean, yes, that, that matters. I think, you know, one of the, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, Laura, but I'm, you know, uh, I'm willing to say whatever. Um, I'm not scared. Uh, you know, one of the the framework that BCDI uses to sort of hold everything that we're about and everything that we preach is economic democracy. Um, and economic democracy um, is about local stakeholders, right, owning and dem democratically owning and democratically governing, right. Um, the the uh, assets that make up you know their their local economy and oftentimes when we talk about the economy people talk about it in sort of class terms rich poor you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but one of the things that we try to um, put front and center because it matters is race and and gender um, and you know the the uh, what's the best way to say this uh, without putting that conversation front and center uh, in in like how we're doing now, I guess, and in our in our conversations around around change making um, and especially systems change, we're sort of going to replicate the the same old same old. So the only other thing I'd want to say is maybe that conversation is not happening here or in places like places here but most certainly in the community organizations that we work with um, and in the communities that we work with that conversations sort of front and center is important and not not ever 
is, is always spoken about. Um, so it does matter. It will matter. Part that is part of the change. I th we're trying. <laughs> we're we're trying to make. Um, and and yeah. Well, it's about power, right? So ownership is power. And um, Mondragon cooperatives have a phrase that I find useful in many parts of my life, which is the instrumental and subordinate nature of capital. Um, and I think we can think about the instrumental and subordinate nature of, of philanthropy um, in this context, if that's if I don't get kicked out of the room for saying that. Um, uh, you know, if we're foregrounding women and people of color leading their own movements, they're doing the community organizing, they're doing the business development to a great extent, and they can hire that expertise in. What they need is capital um, and social capital as well. I think it's financial capital, right? So the social capital to move the institutions that are going to support the work. Um, but I think it's it's really important to sort of always foreground that what we're what we are talking about is power and we're talking about community power and the power of people not only to sort of change their lives and own their jobs but to be players in the local economic landscape and and, um, and so those of us and I count myself among them in a position to broker those relationships and, and help build that power need to always remember our instrumental and subordinate nature. Wait, Andrew, Kelly, if they want to do it. If I could just uh, wait, let's just see if any if they wanted to re respond. To I that. mean, the only thing. I, oh, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we look at the the B Corp community, it's a it's uh, it's a largely white owned business community. Uh, women, in interestingly, like a lot of women entrepreneurs, not half, but I think it's close. I think it's like thirty five or forty percent. Uh, of the B Corp community, so uh, less of an issue there. Although even then, if you went and like then segmented that business community on, on size, I would. And this is to, I'm, I'm making this up, but directionally, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, you'd see the smaller businesses being uh, women-owned or women-led, um, and very few people of color. Uh, some, something like uh, 10 percent. So. Um, you know, I think that's a huge, that's like a huge weakness uh, for the B Corp movement. Um, uh, that, it ha that it hasn't done that. And in the end, uh, like the question of power, um, you know, the, the owners and managers of businesses, e even in a more just system, are always going to get more of the benefit of businesses than, uh, than others. And so um, if we don't, if, like for, for us, if we don't figure out how to create Partnerships that uh, that create more uh, that create more minority entrepreneurs, more entrepreneurs, or people of color who actually are the owners uh, or the managers of businesses, then then we will have failed to to achieve the ultimate goal that we uh, defined at the beginning, which was redefining success in business in order to create a shared and durable prosperity. We won't have succeeded. So I would mostly just put that as it's a huge challenge for us. Yeah, and uh, it's it's about you know creating an opportunity for value and practice um, to to meet, and it and it uh, you know race and class is something that we're still tr struggling as a nation to talk about every single day, um, and even you know for um, a woman of color owned corporation, which we are, you know it is upfront in our hiring practices and policies that we're going to hire from our community. And it's not just something that we think about, but it's something that we talk about, and then it's something also that we have to discuss with our board of directors. So it's like, what is the conversation in the boardroom? You know, and, it, and how is that trickling down into your practices? And if the conversation is not being had there, and that's not a comfortable conversation to have, then it doesn't really matter what your programmatic <laughs> initiatives are. You know, it does really have to to come from, yes, the bottom up, and that's very important, but what's the conversation from the top down? And it's it's not really about, um, it's it should be uncomfortable. The conversation's uncomfortable because it is about power and power shifting and power dynamics, but, um, you know, but we're poised to have it. And, um, 
And I, I do think that that's the, you know, being really intentional in terms of percentages. Like, so you want to you, you wanna go for a certain type of representation in your corporation and your business. What does that mean in percentages? And then what does that mean in your hiring practices? You know, end of story. And you know that that may sound like affirmative action in many ways. And guess what? Yes, it is. It's affirmative action, and I'm saying it. And <laughs> damn it, we still need it. You know. And you know, um, yeah. So, and I just want to share that it's also a challenge for us. And it's and it's it's, it's you know, in terms of what is a dem democratic and rep representative staff. What does that look like in our organization? You know, and the people that we hire and work for the point must reflect our community. It, they must. They might only be from the community because that's not what we're saying, but it has to be reflective. And that's not easy always. So it is a challenge, but I think it's it's one worth taking on. Well, can you tell that story briefly about the Federation of Southern Cooperatives? Just a oh, well. I mean, the way that Grid TV looks at it is who are the experts and redefining who the experts are and going and talking to the folks in Mississippi about the roots of uh, the solidarity economy analysis that, that Chokwe Lumumba was talking about brought me beautifully into contact with those who had helped to found the, Southern Fed the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And I'm not sure which exact story you were talking about, but their point was you know, we never separated political rights from economic rights because as soon as we registered someone to vote, they were fired. As soon as we our farmers joined the NAACP, they lost their loans. Some point along the line, some other types of folks decided we're going to separate these two and talk about freedom instead of power. But the discussion is now being had again about what does power without capacity really look like and what would it look like to build capacity and you know what who the experts are? Other people, mostly women and people of color, for whom this has not been a lifestyle choice for the last 100 years or two, but rather a means of survival. Um, I wouldn't just say it's about representation. I would say it's about viability um, for your business, for your plan of inclusion. Um, that's just me. <laughs> Did you have a question? Thank you, Melissa. I'll try and be brief, but I really appreciate the conversation. My name is Sean Paul. I'm here today an organization, International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, together with my colleague Evelyn. Uh, one of my questions, a theme I heard that really excited me here, a new economy, is around culture, wealth, not jobs, but wealth. And if we think about wealth and assets, I certainly resonate in our work, cultural assets. I think they're investable and they matter for community well-being. I'm just wondering, is that a relevant frame in your, in, for each of you? Is how, would, how, how, how do cultural assets and wealth show up in each of your uh, respective areas of work. Kelly talked about that briefly at the beginning. Yes, yeah. uh, you know, um, uh, it's just a part of who we are, um, so it's hard to sparse out. But our mission is about um, the cultural and economic revitalization of the community. So that is about uh, directing investment into nurturing cultural assets, right, uh, which for us has everything to do with art creation or, you know, of, of every single type and providing space for that conversation to, to take place and then also uh, creating, uh, make sure that there's partnerships um, so that the cultural assets of the community are sort of exported out um, as well. So it's very, very much a, a core of you know what what our thinking is. I mean, we, I just talked about the exported culture. <laughs> when you look at hip hop, <laughs> the exported culture. I mean, the pioneers are so mm. they're kind of bitter. I don't blame them because like they're broke and poor. Africa Bambata should be the richest person alive. But you know, so you know, I, I I firmly believe that you know cultural capital is something that we do have to figure out how to recapture, and we're working. Ed. And I should say, I think we have about five more minutes. Is that right? I think that watch is a little slow. Ed Murphy. I'm the director of the Workforce Development Institute. I'm here through the Neighborhood Funders Group, uh, which WDI belongs to. Uh, we're the nonprofit arm of the New York State AFL-CIO. We give away money to 
unions to businesses to women's groups environmental refugees a number of different groups um, but I want to comment I want to preface my comment I want to get into the issue about procurement but I want to preface the comment by the opening quote from uh, Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed the boss is the boss because he knows how things work and I think when Eddie asked the question about what can philanthropy do I think we uh, I'll lead into procurement the woman over here talked about procurement, and the name of the group is the New York State Procurement Council. It's at the Office of General Services in uh, Albany, and that's the, the group that defines many of these issues. My name is here, Ed Murphy. If anybody wants to know more about the Procurement Council or how that works uh, and the meetings, and I think that would be very helpful, and I think philanthropy could help on two levels. I think it's one is helping people who are looking at economic democracy to truly understand how things work because uh, an awful lot of what we look at is what is the governor going to do, the mayor going to do, the city council, or the legislature. But we miss the fact that all uh, many of these decisions are made and guidelines are made not by them, but they're made by independent councils and authorities and how do, how do they play the role in that. And if billions of dollars are being given, you know, I don't even have the, the numbers now, but let's say $10 billion is given out by New York City and uh, $20 billion is given out in contracting by state government. Those guidelines determine whether the co-ops could participate or any other groups could participate. And I think it would be useful for people to know about that. So I think it would be really helpful for philanthropy to be funding some of those uh, help projects that help people really understand where those decisions are made. Because an awful lot of time is spent coming to Albany, talking to the legislature, when the people at Civil Service, Division of the Budget, Procurement Council, Office of General Services, and I sure are actually making those decisions. A great example is people uh, struggle to get a lot of money put over to NYSERDA about solar jobs and all like that. And the money got went over to an organization authority that didn't know anything about how to work with constituency groups. And that, so it really wasn't thought about how you pass the legislation and hundreds of million dollars go to a group that has no relationship to the community and doesn't know how to do that. And I think that inside baseball thing is really important and it may be undramatic, but it's important because that's where the money is, that's where the power is. And I think that what you brought up about the procurement council is very important. If we can help people, then community groups would have more power to be part of that dialogue to gain some of those resources and be able to do that. And lastly, I'm here because organized labor and there's 2.5 million members of organized labor in New York State wants to play in this conversation with people. And it's part of its self-interest, a lot of its self-interest. The demographics are, show that people like me, white, Irish, Catholic, people are not going to be the leaders in the future, it's going to, there's a demographic change, and, and unless we're helping in that transition, there's going to be no union members, and there's going to be no, you know, no, no, no group to really advocate. If 2.5 million members are organized and focused on something, and their families, you've got a shot at getting something done. And the, the question is, how do we create the dialogue with everybody else? Richard? Yeah, I'm Richard Healy. I'm an advisor to the Saladago Fund and with the Grassroots Policy Project. And the last comment was was helpful for me because my picture of the new economy is 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 composed of lots of of units of the kind of group of things that you're forming, which are so valuable. But it's not just those groups one by one by one, good business by good business and co-op. And I, I suspect I see nodding heads. So partly our the challenge posed to all of us is how do we move from that the picture we have now and growing some of those to a more global transformation and so we've used the word power a lot uh, today it's been used in different ways uh, two and a half million people I find that a persuasive number about changing changing a lot of things in New York we also mentioned earlier uh, a group in Buffalo New York push which belongs to National People's Action so it both does cooperative work but it's part of a national organization that, that has the power strategy about larger political changes in our country, which could change regs, change rules, change policies. Uh, and that seems to me really the other part of the challenge is how we connect the kind of work you're doing, which is so critical, uh, but also connected to a much clearer political strategy. 
uh, that thinks thinks you know at the local, the state, and the national level uh, that uh, that that perhaps sees, and I'm not sure has to see that the units you're forming are part of a base for those changes. But I'm curious, how much do you see the kind of, of, of B Corps, uh, of co-ops, can they be a base, can they be connected to a larger political, big P and little p political strategy? My name is Aditi Wavy. I'm with the Solidago Foundation and Sea Forward Fund. And it was related to that, too, so if I could just pick up Richard. Um, my related question is, you know, we I, I heard, I think, Melissa, you may have said this, that uh, can we imagine what the world would look like in a, when, if we had a friendly city government? You know, in friendly city governments, things are possible that are not possible. I think it's related to what you're saying, Richard, in that some of us in the room have funded quite a bit of work through other nonprofits and some of yours as well that have been working to build capacities to and political power, right, to influence the system. And so I'm curious whether there's there's been talk about the way in which B Corps, worker cooperatives, and others actually are engaging in the political system, not just to create the changes that you want to see happen within an economic an economic democracy frame, but also as it's related to a larger set of values, right, that I think is really embedded in some of what you brought up related to the Southern uh, worker co-op work too, not kind of separating economic rights from political rights. So, But I'm curious what that work looks like and what those ideas are that you may be generating and looking to see ways to, to connect to some of these other organizations that have been po building political power. I would say we're just at we're early stages on that, but it's a clear part of our plan. You have to keep in mind that until two years ago, we were a tiny little organization with half-time staffing. And so as we've built capacity, that political um, engagement is like one of our first things. But we envision doing it embedded in other organizations. So we can mobilize a few foot soldiers, but there aren't enough for us for NPA to you know, care about us yet, although we do have a relationship with them. And we're interested in offering our, you know, ourselves as part of a base building strategy. Um, we're also engaged with the American Sustainable Business Council with B-Labs, we, we're in conversation with, uh, you know, we've talked to PICO, we've sort of understanding the relationship on the ground is important nationally, but it's, we're just exploring it. It's a commitment, but we're exploring it. I would say that the bulk of the, excuse me, political organizing work has been going on at the local level, um, you know, for the past five, 10 years. And there are actually, you know, movements, um, Jorman is part of it, I'll turn it over to him in a second, that Richmond, California, Madison, Wisconsin, Philly, you know, they're, uh, there are um, Cleveland. You know, there there are actually several cities around the country that are looking at this, and and our members have been driving some of those conversations and helping shape that. So until six months ago, we had an exclusively local strategy, and now we're opening it up. But I'm kind of curious. I was going to say, um, there's a in conversations I have about the new economy. There's always like different people that sort of enter that space for, for different reasons. So I'll talk about this, my experience and, you know, my friends, why we got into the, the new economy space. And it's, not, it's sort of related and branched off from our power building political analysis and, and activities. Um, it, they're not different, exclusive uh, uh, conversations for us. So, you know, Northwest Bronx Community Clergy, our, our community partners are folks like Northwest Bronx Community Clergy Coalition. They're an MPA affiliate, you know, by the way. Um, you know, uh, The Point, Mothers on the Move, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they all engage in, 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 in community organizing that was very much focused um, on building people power to go and beat up electeds, to make them do the right thing, basically. Uh, um, and to do that, and I, you know, it's it's been working here and there, and, and you know, that's a way to think about building power. Early on, the precursor to BCDI, one of the things we spoke about that will center in our conversation is, you know, our our organizing has been getting better and better. You know, we we're able to contact more and more members. We're able to get them through a lot more sophisticated leadership development pipelines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera better and better. But then like Kelly said, 30 years later, we're 
all of our membership is still poor, still broke, right? So organizing is getting better and better, but everyone's still broke. And we think part of the reason is that um, our organizing is not leading to our membership owning and controlling the assets that drive policy change. So the idea, you know, so that's how we got into the new economy stuff. That's when it was like cooperatives. That's the most genius idea I've ever heard in my life, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When we started exploring that space, it sort of grew out of, of, of that conversation. So we don't, I think a lot of, not everyone in the movement sees it that way, but at least, you know, the folks we're dealing with, that's how we see it. That's where it, it, it grew out of, so. I think we have time for one last question. Oh, and I it better be a stinger. <laughs> oh, no! I was already feeling the pressure. Good. Now I don't even know if I can talk. <laughs> um, well, so I'm Deirdre Hess. I'm from the Heron Foundation. And I am so thrilled to actually hear it. so much of what you're saying really resonate with what we've been um, working for. And especially in the last two years, we've been in the process of changing our strategy to, to deal with poverty as not a marginal thing where if you if you can just get somebody into a house I'm sure they can get into the mainstream but rather as a structural thing and dealing with that um, and I'm hearing you talk about like the healthcare cooperatives are actually you know PHI is one of our grantees um, I'm, I'm hearing you know, like we talk about investing in the enterprise like you're saying you need the organization to have funding not just the projects and so we talk about all these things we're very excited um, so one of the questions and this is mostly for Andrew I think um, one of the challenges that we come up against as we try to move our entire endowment to mission-related investing is, you know, we sort of have this idea that all investing is impact investing, that it's not just an asset class. And then one of the challenges is that when we think about the whole universe of possible investments, how do we find the information that tells us what the social impact of any given investment is? So, and, and another question is, um, how can... Uh, companies that you don't think of as an impact investment, you know, how, how can they start to move in this direction? And I'm specifically thinking of this um, example you gave of, of Campbell's and, and how they, you know, bought this company but managed to keep it separate as a B Corp. And are there other examples you can think of about how, how the universe of potential investments can be seen as potential impact investments and how we can measure and understand what impact it is they're having, whether positive or negative? Those are great questions. Um, but, so let me start by saying, I, when I was going to answer this question before, but I, somehow I didn't quite manage to do it, about um, somebody somebody was asking about uh, what can foundations do and, and uh, investing their capital as opposed to just giving it away. Um, I mean, an unpopular thing to say is that, that most foundations don't invest their endowments in any way consistent with their mission. Uh, and a few do like a tiny bit, like one or two percent, and 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 you know we should celebrate that. That said, Heron uh, is at what twenty five percent, forty now. Okay, well, awesome. so like off the charts leadership, and everybody else should do at least what they do, um, and that would make a pretty big difference just all by itself. Um, and most foundations, you know, either either by culture or or courage, don't do it. Um, so, sorry for saying something controversial. Um, so that said, uh, um, I think this is a huge challenge. Like the fact is, not every investment is an impact investment because there's plenty of businesses and plenty of uh, financial products that are doing all kinds of horrible things. And so, um, you know, it's hard to make much sense of how you can make some investments and be doing anything positive with them. Clarify, yeah. The right. Okay. Great. So all, all, yes, all investments have some kind of impact and the question is how you move them from negative to positive and there's all kinds of strategies that, that range from, you know, lots of stuff that's been around for a long time, like, like engaging the companies that are doing bad things through shareholder activism to get them to do, uh, to get them to do better. Um, and there's some good, you know, examples of that recently. Like Apple has changed a whole bunch of things that they do, mostly through some combination of consumers and shareholders uh, being pretty, pretty activist in their um, in their outlook. Uh, um, but I think, like on the on the more positive impact side, the hardest thing is 
no one really knows how to measure, or people haven't until recently been able to really think much about how to measure the impact of, that businesses are having, either, either negative or positive. Like with a nonprofit, if it has a very specific goal uh, for its work, you can measure that specific thing. For a business, uh, you know, they have a huge amount of impact on all these different stakeholders and putting all of that together. I mean, Norman was talking about this a little bit. You can like measure the number of jobs that they created, but if those were actually pretty shitty jobs, uh, or, or if they created a bunch of jobs, but those didn't create any ownership and wealth for people, or, they, or the company, the thing that they're actually producing created great jobs for people, but the thing they're actually producing is horrible for the world, like you have to look in a pretty comprehensive way at the total impact of a business. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do has been about um, creating the standards that allow all businesses to measure what matters, uh, which is the whole, we think. Um, and so, you know, you can be making investments in businesses that are having a positive impact on the world and measuring that and then creating policy incentives to do, get those to do even better. But the other thing we can do is just put everybody on a path. And the, one of the most important learnings for us has just been you can get every business to measure what matters and put them on a path and you can create policies that just drive everybody to at least start by measuring and being transparent. Um, and that's what I was saying before about you know, there are 1,000 B Corps, there are 15,000 companies that are using these standards that we created and increasingly a lot of investors. So there's 100 private equity and venture funds uh, and institutional investors and foundations that are using those standards that we use for B Corp certification to measure the impact of their investments. Um, and increasingly a large number of, um, of, of philanthropists trying to use those tools. And I think it's really important to try to drive, like without beating everybody up, you can tell everybody you can meet everybody where they are and then provide them with the tools to measure in a transparent way and then improve their performance. Does everybody in the room feel that we are on the path? Are you on the path, people? <laughs> <laughs> yes, is the answer. If you want more information about Grit TV, you can get it from Natalie Pert right over there. I want to thank Kelly, Terry, Sepulveda, Andrew Kasoy, Melissa Hoover, and Jorman Nunez over there. Thank you. I just want to say in closing, I'm going to ask uh, Jose and Leah to, Leah to say a few words uh, of goodbye. But I just want to say, first of all, big thank you to Philanthropy New York for, for you know, hosting this. And um, you know, we're really ultimately doing this to guide greater philanthropic investment in the creation of the new economy, the economy that's more equitable for more people. And ultimately, the only way we can do that is if we all turn to our colleagues after today and say, there's this session, there's a series of sessions going on, please go to the next one. So please, please spread the word. We're very excited about this. Jose? Thank you. I think what Richard and Alicia said is critical to the philanthropic world. How do we find Not only from a research standpoint, but from a standpoint. How do we, you know, want to adapt it, adapt to the world in a different way? How do we align from a different standpoint? How do we make our work value? <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. I don't have anything else to add except um, that the next session, what is the date of the next session? April it's April 9th. Um, and so the Dago and, uh, and Serna is helping and Ford are all co-organizing that. It looks like the date was printed wrong on this paper that went around. On the name on the nature of work. Um, so thank you for coming. I think people are going for drinks potentially nearby. So if anyone wants to do that, just hang around. And Laura, thank you so much. Thank you. So there is one more request, which is this is kind of an experiment to talk about something as big as changing our political economic system and try and bring it down to earth in kind of digestible you know, chunks. And so we'd really love your feedback about this session, what worked, what didn't work, and we'd really like you, if possible, to attend the next sessions. And let us know whether or not this is a good way to think about system change by taking it in um, piece by piece, in a way. So we would really appreciate that. Thank you.